Today on Rambling About Cars, will I AMG or will I won't? Honda Civic is finally going to debut the Type R version in June. A 682 horsepower Escalade, a crazy powerful Land Rover, Range Rover, Sport, Scout is coming back, International, all kinds of cool news to talk about. Plus, we have some comments that we need to catch up on. So without further ado, it is podcast time. I am Christopher Smith. Welcome, everybody, especially... Chris Bruce, how you doing, man? I'm doing really well. Hey, I just real quick before we get yes. into the meat of the show, I want to do a quick kind of businessy type thing, and that is something you and I have kind of been banding about for the last two weeks or so, yeah, and kind like of that. before that. We this has come up before. You and I would like to watch a movie and comment on it kind of do if anyone's watched Mystery Science Theater 3000 or Riff Tracks or anything like that. We would like to do something like that with an automotive based movie. Um, it turns out so Seth Beersma, who has been our guest in the past, he has never seen any of the Fast and the Furious movies. I have only seen two of the Fast and the Furious. What? Movies. Yeah. Now, I, I'm the oldest guy here. How is it that I've, well, maybe that's why I've seen them all. But no, <laughs> exactly. that doesn't, that, that explains why I saw like the, uh, like the original and maybe like, you know, Tokyo Drift and those, but doesn't explain why I watched the Fiero fly to space. But so we're thinking that we would do a watch along series. It would be completely separate from rambling about cars. In my mind, it would be called rambling about car movies or something like something that. Like that. Um, you know, but it'd it, probably be it, Friday it be or a Saturday evening. And what we would do is we would um, set up a thing. It would probably be through Motor One's Twitch account or maybe one, maybe through Motor One's YouTube live account. You know, we would start maybe half an hour beforehand, get people in, say, hey, everyone, here's the link. Or if it's on Amazon Prime or something like that, go to this place. Um, we're all going to press play at the same time. And then you are going to watch Smith and I, Smith, uh, Smith, Seth and I, sorry, too many S's, um, <laughs> uh, all at the same time. And we're going to react to it. It, and it so, could be fun. It could be fun. And obviously it's, I mean, we're just kind of spitballing this idea here, but with exactly with, with people that haven't seen these movies yet, um, I would love to see some of your reactions because yeah, I mean, I've seen every one in the, in the series so far. Well, here's and... the thing. Uh, so if anyone out there has heard of the producer, Roger Corman, he was prolific throughout the 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. 70s, I think even in the 80s. But um, he did a whole lot of low budget films. And it just so happened he did a film called The Fast and the Furious. Oh, uh, what? It was, uh, it's either from 54 or 55. I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's in the public domain because not only can you find it on YouTube, you can find it on archive.org and just watch it. And so as with any of these things, Smith and I have to have a proof of concept that we can go to our bosses and say, hey, this is our idea. This is what it would look like. This, you know, people would follow us. So I'm just saying, if you are a listener of this show, we're still early on here. If you think that you would join us and watch something like that, ping us either on this post that's going to be on, on uh, motor1.com, send an email to podcast at motor1.com, comment Let on the know. YouTube page. Just we're, we're feeling the waters here. Like if we and get no reaction and it's dead, like, okay, maybe we won't do it. But if we get some folks that want to watch along to a starting off a weird old film, and then maybe if we can convince people the Fast and the Furious series, I'm game. It would probably, in my mind, it would be like a monthly thing. So first weekend of the month, last weekend of the month, whatever it worked Definitely. out, we would just do one one at a time and go through. And then maybe we would watch other car movies. I don't know. If anyone's ever seen it, it's not a car movie. It's a motorcycle movie that's trying to rip off Fast and the Furious. But Torque is the dumbest movie <laughs> ever, and I would love to watch it with people. I haven't, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen I it have. simply, simply based on the title because it's like it's a motorcycle movie called Torque. What motor vehicles generally don't have any torque whatsoever? Motorcycles. It's terrible, but terrible in the best way possible. And for any of you people who like Parks and Rec, Adam Scott is in it as maybe the villain, maybe the <laughs> hero. Like I, Adam Scott, it it's a 
bad good movie. So it could be I'm it could be saying, a good one for the list. So yeah, yes. let us know. Let us know if you yes. want to see this. Let us know if you want to join us on this adventure. I think it could be a lot of fun. I, I know I, the the stream and comment. It's what all the kids are doing these days. So yes, we we've yep. gotta we've gotta stick with the kids, especially since I just had a birthday. I really need to stick with the kids. Um, I'm getting I'm getting to the I point now where I, borderline there, Smith. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I'm I starting to understand when James May, and I can't remember what program it was in, when he was like, you know, I I never imagined myself as old. I'm not old really by that definition yet, but I'm, hey, I'm getting there. So we've got to, we've got to stick with what the kids are doing. So let us know if you want to join us on that. And you know what, yeah. Bruce, before we jump into the news, this is something that we, we don't usually do, but perhaps the listeners are just want to know a little bit about what's going on in our lives like i just i just had a birthday um i mean let's just catch up for a few minutes i mean what have you been up to man i mean we we write automotive news every day we have our team's account where we're chatting but we don't really get much of a chance to catch up so i mean just what's been going on in your life here the last the last month or year or decade or so year jesus man <laughs> um so you actually, I don't think, know about this because you're not in. So, Ride Apart is in our motorsport.com yes. Motor One universe. Ride Apart is our motorcycle site. They mm -hmm. do fantastic work. I highly recommend checking out rideapart.com. Definitely. But, Smith, you are not part of their chat. So, I don't think you know about this, but I am a motorcycle owner now. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not yep. part of the chat. What do you, what do you have? I now own a Honda Navi, which is. It, it's not quite a scooter and it's not quite a motorcycle. So there's no, it okay. is a, it has a CVT, like a twist and go um, scooter, okay. but it, it's not step through. So you still, it has a saddle that you have to kind of step over and put, put yourself into. What, what's, what's the engine on that? It is a 110 CC single cylinder okay. carbureted engine making, I believe if you look at Honda, they say it's 7.8 horsepower. We're going to call it eight horsepower just to be generous. Um, and so, yeah, I got that, um, I got it in February or no, I got it in March. I'm sorry. However, because of the weather here in Northwestern Ohio, I got to write it once I got it to write it the day after I picked it up. I think you have told I, me about this now. Okay. I just, I just, I just didn't remember it, but no, I mean, tell, right. me, tell me, tell me more about it because yep. and, yeah, and I old, finally, don't remember it's starting to warm up here. And so I've started, I wrote it again on Sunday for the second time and it's been, you know, it's been a cool thing. My dad has been into motorcycles kind of forever. Um, he raced motocross when he was in kind of his teens. And he, we have, or he has, I should say, um, just a plethora of, he likes kind of small displacement bikes. So we've got a, uh, we've got a Vespa GS150. Mm. He's got an Aprilia SR50. He's mm. got a Honda Cub. He just got his Navi last week. Um, and there's something, oh, and he's got a, uh, a Vespa Primavera 150 as well. So lots of scooters for him. And so, yeah, I just kind of took after the family and I've got one now and it, it's the same color as my mini or near as makes no difference. And it sits right in front of it in the uh, garage because my, the mini is small. Thankfully it's as to its name and it's an R50. So it's actually small. And so <laughs> the uh the navi sits right in front of it so that's, i am that's very cool can you believe i'm 30 miles from like sturgis south dakota the the motorcycle mecca of dude if i showed up at sturgis world. my navi and, i would get and, beat up yeah <laughs> i you're not wrong you're not wrong i i mean it's it's like harley central I've been tempted by a bike, but I I wouldn't want a Harley. I I want like an older Honda or a Suzuki, yeah. and you see some of those out here. But totally, oh, very, that's very very cool, man. Very cool. But what about you? What's your what have been your uh, combustion engine adventures recently? Uh, well, I mean, I finally got around to replacing the distributor on the Mustang. It's it's that was like three weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, thereabouts. I mean, yeah. I the car is not a daily driver, so it's not going out very much. Um, I had it to the point where, okay, as long as I kept the battery supercharged up 
it would start up. But I mean, it was it was cutting out every now and again. All the symptoms were pointing to just a bad distributor, not just replacing the cap and rotor. So I finally replaced that. And uh, after driving it now for a couple of weeks, yes, that was the problem because it fires right up. It's running good. I finally had some warm weather this past weekend to go out for a little drive. And I went to a section of Dakota Badlands that you don't really get to see from the national park. It's it's not really necessarily necessarily just a local thing, but um, you know, you go out on, on some of the back roads and it's only the second time I've been to that section of the state. I mean, it's a really nice cool. drive. So it's nice to be able to get back out and enjoy the convertible a little bit, enjoy the noise a little bit. Um, that's pretty much, I mean, that's pretty much the extent I'm planning to uh, make a little bit of a move back towards Michigan later this year. So a lot of my resources are focused in that direction, which means in about a month or so, I'm going to be on an extended vacation. I don't know if I'll if I'll do the podcast from Michigan or if oh, uh, or or this or, is literally news to me. This, this is literally news. Yeah. This. Well, this this is coming later in June where I've I've got to take a, a a trip to just kind of get some things set up. So don't know if I'll podcast. I'm I'm going to try to podcast while I'm there. You better try because uh, just, just otherwise, so just so people can get an idea of of the new uh, the new Smith Lair. Because I mean I. I I'll be building a big office, um, you know, in the new house. So, well, not only that, but we're going to have to line up some guest hosts because I, I, <laughs> it's, it's if, just no it's one's going to listen day. to this show if I just do it alone. It's, it's just, just going to be me and the Corgi. Like, hey, Cooper, it, what do you think of that? It's like, just what I know. I'm, I'm going to try to do the podcast from there. Um, okay. And and if it, if it all works out, hopefully it'll be a really entertaining show because this is going to be a really cool location to podcast from. So I'll just, okay. I'll just leave the teaser at that, but should we talk about some news here? We've kind of rambled. Yeah. We're already kind of off the rails a little bit. Nothing wrong Not with that. Really. We don't have any guests this week. So, yep. Um, oh, real quick. Speaking of which, oh. sorry for anyone who listened last week. I said we were going to have a guest. That was oh. totally my fault. I looked at the calendar wrong. Our guest is coming next week, next and week. then we have another guest the following week. So we have guests for the rest of May. I just got the two weeks transposed. I'm sorry, folks. It's just Smith and I today, but <laughs> we'll have a guest next week. I'm, you know, I'm kind of wishing we had somebody else to distract us from this first news story that we're going to talk about. Um, you don't. This, this this came out a little while ago. You know, rapper Will I Am. He's a he's a car guy, and and I have yes. I have mad respect for that. Um, and he's done some very interesting projects in the past. He's got a new one that's called the Will I AMG and. There's no other way to say it. It's like a G63 had a baby with a GT four door and well, it looks interesting um, for those not following us on YouTube. You'll want to go to motor one podcast on YouTube, like follow, subscribe, all of that good stuff. So you can see what we're talking about for those listening. Imagine like you're sleeping and you wake up, but you're still in that kind of like, like sleep paralysis mode where you're you're awake enough to realize okay I'm awake but your body isn't moving yet and there's something scary over your head that's kind of what this is it's literally it's literally the front of a G63 um with the body of a GT4 door only but it's two it's door. a two door <laughs> yeah they 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 took two of the doors off so yeah so it's, smith can i tell you something embarrassing I oh god, you like you it. like it, don't you? A little I, bit, I like not, it. I mean, it's not it's not terrible. I guess the more you look at it, the more it's like, oh, okay. But also, it's I, you, you I take, have to say, I'm a little bit jealous of having the the amount of money that Will I Am must have had. So we should say this was not built by Mercedes. This was built right. actually by West Coast Customs, who right. I assume people have heard of. If not if you weren't around in the late nineties and you didn't hear West coast customs, they were all over the place. Yeah. Very, um, very prominent uh, custom shop out in California. Yes. Very prominent. Um, they actually built this, but I can't imagine having the amount of money to go to someone and say, Hey, take the front end of a G 63 graft it on to a uh, AMG four door, take the rear doors off and turn it into a coupe and build that for me and and, and the irony that's here, what he did like yeah and the irony here is that okay how many times have people commented oh the amg gt four-door coupe 
it's four doors. It's not a coupe. Well, now it actually, <laughs> by that definition, now it actually is. And it looks pretty good from the nose back, but you, you have this combination of the very chunky G63 boxy styling on the front with the swooping curves at the back. And I mean, the, the build itself looks very well done. Um, very well. You, you almost can't tell that it's aftermarket. Like it's, the bear logo at the front, which apparently yep. is a will I am thing. He says it's bear witness B E A R not, yep. you know, but so that kind of tells you that there's something going on here, but if it had just a Mercedes logo on it, you could think it was a interesting concept. Like you could know it, there's never going to be a production car that looks mm -hmm. like this, but you could believe with these proportions that it was a concept. Well, if you didn't, so, if you didn't know the G63 existed and the, the AMG GT four door existed, it would make sense. Folks that know of these vehicles. I mean, as soon as you see it, it's just going to be like, I mean, for me, it's, I mean, it's polarizing. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and, and be a jerk about it because it does look like a, a very, very well done build. It's got the cool, like, like uh, the, those weird, like butterfly doors that open up on it. That's a pretty cool feature. The fabrication that's got into it. Like I said, a lot of, lot of quality looking work here. It's just the styling just doesn't quite mesh with me. And hey, that's all right. It, uh, yeah, it, does, it doesn't have to be is, everything to everybody. Yeah, and that's subjective. But what I think objectively you can say is that West Coast Customs did a hell of a good job here. Like, you really, and I, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you're looking at the profile shot maybe up close like you know maybe from inches away you could tell that this thing was kind of hacked together i don't know but in these photographs it looks good yeah it looks real like so bravo you know with 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 the the long hood and kind of the short deck at the back um since it's it's a four door that's been shrunk down to two i get a real slr mclaren vibe from the side don't you yeah and it has these like pseudo T tops. Like, I don't think you can remove these panels, but it still has the the spine in the middle of it that kind of gives it that little T top appearance. Like they did a good job, for, you know, it, whether you like it or not, like the the construction that went into this, I, I you know, I applaud them. Respect the build, but just not for me. Sure. And totally. that's and that's fine. And that's fine. You want to talk about something that's probably going to be for all of us? Which one? Are we oh, talking Civic? Oh, which one? Yeah, let, let's jump to the Civic news. So, okay, we've we've heard just recently. Okay, the Honda Civic Type R. We've seen it camouflaged in prototype form for what? ages for, for, for like years. like the last like the last hundred years at least. It's like <laughs> yeah. it's like okay, you had the eighteen eighty six motor wagon, and then the Civic Type R was promised and it's been a hundred plus years. I might be exaggerating there a little bit, but we finally like writing about car news every day. We finally know it's going to be revealed in June and yep. it's going to be revealed before. If, am, am I correct on this, Bruce? They're going to reveal this before their event in, um, in at Indiana mid at mid Ohio. Yep. But Not at mid Ohio, Ohio but, but yeah, but, right. But, Here's the thing. They're going to reveal like like fully reveal it. Like take the camo off, here's the car. Before Mid Ohio, but as I understand, there's still going to be the camouflaged prototype at Mid Ohio. I I'm not That's sure. what they're saying right now and we're in May. I wonder so it, it's worth pointing out that the Mid Ohio race is July 1st through 3rd. Mm -hmm. I wonder by the time this debuts in June somewhere in Europe, we don't know exactly where yet. They're just saying at an event in Europe. I wonder whether Honda will change that. I I don't know, but it would it doesn't make a lot of sense to show it uncamouflaged in Europe and then however many weeks later show it in Ohio with camouflage on it. Like, I wonder right. if that's going to change. I mean, unless, unless there, it's going to be one of those cases where, okay, the Euro spec car is a little different than the U S spec yeah. car, which 
I I don't think that's going to be the case. Well, maybe um, it's but- a little like it'll be a slight it'll be a inlet here that's maybe a little bit larger in one mm-hmm. region or something. It's not going to be much, but right. I mean, I mean, this is this is fairly recent news as we're uh, as we're recording this today. So yeah, um, there's there's certainly plenty of time between now and when it's going to debut for things to change. This is just what we're hearing right now. Um, but the big news is finally we're going to get a full reveal, um, yes. and I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it. We don't know for sure yet what's going to be under the hood. Um, it's believed to be just a, a version of the two liter turbo. That's going to be a little bit more than, than the, uh, the current car, but mm-hmm. not, not like the wild. I mean, I know there've been some rumors out there that, oh, it, it, it it'll be a hybrid with 400 yeah. horse. And, and uh, we don't think that's going to be the case at all. No, we're not getting any sign of that. So the current civic type R makes 306 horsepower in the United States. It makes 316 horsepower, mm-hmm. an extra 10 in Europe. And what we're hearing is that it's going to be a tuned version of that. So it's going to make a little bit more. So I hate to speculate. The number that comes to my head is 320. Like Mm -hmm. that, you know, a little bit more power, not a lot more power. We know it's only going to come with a manual gearbox. Uh, Honda has confirmed that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, it you know, it's going to be a little bit more than the current Civic Type R. But the other thing is, is that from everything Honda has been saying, this is going to be the final Civic Type R with a combustion engine. So mm-hmm. if you are married to that, if you love the idea of a combustion engine, this, this is, is it. This you got to go this way because it's not going to happen again. Yep, this is it. And and to further support, um, you know, just the slight bump in power, um, they Honda recently released information on uh, turning laps. I think Suzuka, right, Bruce? Yep. Yep, uh, where, where they they edged out the the current Civic Type R by the Type R like, limited like, edition by like a second, but by like a second. So, I mean, it's quicker, but if you're going to, if you're talking about something with 400 horse, I would expect to see something bigger than a second difference. So, right. Um, I mean, um, I, I think that kind of supports um, what we, what we've been hearing on the, on the more mild side, but I mean, a second, I mean, that's still, I mean, that's still a healthy, it's something, but so a healthy to, make it, to make it clear, the civic type R limited edition, it has a bunch of things to make the weight lighter. And presumably mm-hmm. they were running the standard version of the new civic type R around there. So it makes sense that they up the power by enough to offset the weight difference from the limited yep. edition to get that, you know, it was actually less than a, it's, it was a fraction of a second. If you, it was a second, like with rounding air, basically. So mm-hmm. it's not a lot, but that's what leads us to believe that um, they up the power by just enough to make it quicker, but it's not going to be, you know, this gargantuan massive. Right. Change. Well, you know, interesting that, that you say massive gargantuan change um, because that's, I think a really, really good segue into the next vehicle we're going to talk about that just debuted uh, today, actually, as we're, as, as we're recording this. It, it debuted this morning. We're talking this, about... This big boy? We're talking... Oh, oh, it's a big boy. We're talking about the 2023 Cadillac Escalade V. This, this SUV actually made its exterior debut at the beginning of the year. Um, it, I mean, it's it's got you know, slightly different front fascia. Um, it's, it's got unique wheels. It's got blacked out trim, but Cadillac didn't tell us anything about what was going on underneath. Now we have full information. And would you like a 682 horsepower Escalade? Because that's what you get. Cadillac says it is the most powerful full-size SUV in the world. 682 horsepower, 653 pound-feet of torque from the supercharged 6.2 liter V8. For the record, it is the same engine that they offer in the CT5V Blackwing. However, for the Escalade, they give it a different supercharger. They, they, it's, it's got different lobes um, tuned a little bit differently. So the peak power, it's a little bit more. Um, the Blackwing, I think, is maxes out at 668 horsepower at 6,500 RPMs. This is 682 at 6,000. So the peak power is hitting a little bit lower. Um, the odd offset to that is 
The Escalade V has a little bit less torque at 653 pound feet. I think the Blackwing sedan is 658. I mean, it, you're not going to notice any difference. And the torque. Let's talk um, about the elephant in the room, and that's the price. <laughs> What do you what, what do you mean? It, it's it's very reasonably priced at one hundred and forty nine thousand nine hundred and ninety dollars. That e that even includes destination charges. But it does not we don't know there's going to be an ESV version of the V and we yes. don't have pricing for that yet, though. Am I you correct? Could, correct. You can the um, Cadillac is offering the Escalade V either in the, the just the regular version or the stretched out ESV. Um Regardless of what you get there, Cadillac says it's zero to 60 in under 4.4 seconds. I don't know if that means 4.3, but that's, but, I mean, it's, quick for it's, a it's smoking fast. Um, the quarter mile, 12.7 seconds at 110. Um, they list the top speed at 124. And I'm, I mean, that's, I'm sure that's, that's just computer limited. Um, Cadillac didn't explain why it was limited to 124, but I mean, Let's be honest, people that are buying an Escalade V, they're not interested in top speed. They're interested in punching no. the gas, you know, plastering the kids in the groceries to the back seat for a little bit. Um, I want to point out, though, it's yeah, it, it, it's stupid fast. It has gobs of power, but this isn't a black wing. This is an Escalade V. And I asked Cadillac about this directly. I said, well, you're you're jumping like like gobs of horsepower over a regular Escalade. Um, why is this not a Blackwing? And the difference is high performance versus ultra high performance. In other words, <laughs> people... Well, PR language if I've ever heard it. it, it but. It's PR language, but it does make sense to me because Blackwing, there's, there's a lot of focus on, okay, if you want to take this to the track and really just throw it around a track, it's pretty capable there. Escalade V, no, this this isn't going to be something that you're taking to a track. Um, its main focus is still comfort and luxury. The suspension is tweaked a little bit. Um, it's got the, the standard magnetic ride control, the air suspension. The rear springs are a little stiffer. Um, there's some different tuning in the damper. That's pretty much it for the suspension, though. Um, you do get a dedicated V mode that will firm everything up at the push of the button. It's also all customizable. So if you want your steering a little stiffer with the brakes, a little stiffer with the suspension, a little softer, you can customize it however you want. Of course it has launch control. So you can get that zero to 60 in 4.4 seconds. Um, but it is still focused on a, being a comfortable cruiser. So it, it makes sense to me why this isn't called Blackwing in that respect. Sure. Um, you do get upgraded brakes. There's six piston brakes in the front. Um, they didn't mention anything about brake upgrades in the rear. Uh, what else we got here? $149,990. It is pretty pricey. Um, specifically, I think it's equal to a CT5 sedan uh, versus the Escalade Platinum Edition, which I think starts around $110,000. Okay. So... It, it's a big jump. Cadillac does say, and I mean, they they were pretty upfront about it. Um, it's the most powerful, most exclusive, most expensive Escalade ever. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, they they they've done a fair amount of research on it. They say that Escalade V buyers are pretty much going to be the same as Escalade buyers. It's going to be a low volume vehicle. Um, I couldn't get them to say what their target was for production, uh, but it'll be available for a few years anyways. And, and yeah, I mean, it's really, when you get inside, it's pretty much a platinum inside. They don't go crazy with like, you know, contrast stitching and the performance seats. Um, they just inject it with a lot of power. They tweak the suspension a little bit. They upgrade the brakes um, as you should, if you're going to have a, a three ton SUV going zero to 60 in, in four and a half seconds. But yeah, um, the price was obviously a pretty big shock. I don't know how many they're going to sell, but they feel pretty confident that they'll go. We've seen platinum demand, Escalade platinum demand is is still up there to the point where Cadillac can't really keep up. So there's no shortage of people ready to step up and pay well into six figures for an Escalade. So, Well, even a, a platinum, if I'm not mistaken, is 110-ish. Plat platinum starts uh, just around one ten. Um, if yeah. you get if you if you get the shorter model, I think it's just under the ESV starts at one ten, and that's before any options. Um, sure. 
the Escalade V does, I mean, it does come standard with all kinds of stuff, the, the magnetic ride control. Um, the Super Cruise will be available, but that is listed as an option. We don't know exactly. Whoa, 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 what... whoa, whoa. I didn't realize that. Super Cruise isn't standard if you're already paying 150 grand. They they say Super Cruise will be available as an option. Yeah, it, it's not part of the standard whoa. package. So as far as what else will be optional, we still don't know. Um, that'll I didn't we'll, we'll, that. we'll learn all that once the configurator goes live. Um, it's gonna go on sale later this year. And yeah, 682 horsepower Escalade. You know, people have been asking for, in Cadillac's defense, they people have been asking for a high-performance Escalade for a while now. Sure, they have been. You're right. So, I mean, it's it's certainly been a long time coming. We'll see how it goes. I think it looks pretty cool. I'm I'm happy with the Escalade styling. It looks fun. It looks like an Escalade with you some can't not bits. like. Right. You can't not like having that much power under your foot. But uh, as I was doing just a little bit of research on price, a Mercedes Maybach GLS is 160. It starts at 160. And this Escalade <laughs> V, this Escalade V starts at 150. So And you don't get super cruise. <laughs> so, so, you know, the question is, are Cadillac buyers going to consider stepping into Mercedes Maybach territory? Oh man, that's a good like, question. Huh? Okay. I, I yeah. I I knew about the price. I knew about the 150k yep. price. I assumed it was essentially every bell and whistle they could pack into this thing, in addition to the more powerful engine. I didn't realize well how much was optional. Well, and 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 to be fair, we still don't know. Okay. Um, they mentioned that Super Cruise would be available as an option. They did say that, that it wasn't part of the standard equipment. That, I mean, we could be talking about like, you know, maybe an extra grand or two for, it's, for option dude, up, it's upgrade. It's not be an extra grand or two. <laughs> right. But <laughs> the point being, if you just want the standard Escalade V, I mean, you're still getting the, the awesome digital display. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the big screen, you're still getting full leather seats all the way back. You're still getting, the, you know, all, all your massaging functions. It's got augmented reality, uh, built into it for navigation. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's a well-equipped vehicle. Cool. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I, like I said, you and I discussed it. I didn't realize quite every, I didn't realize that there were so many options, but Hey, if Cadillac thinks that they can offer those options and people will buy them good on them. I'm I mean, it's, I mean, it's good. It's going to be a low volume vehicle. All, all sure. of the V, you know, you know, all of the really aggressive V vehicles are low yeah. volume. So, um, you know, we'll see time will tell it's going to be around for a couple of years at least. So time will tell. And I'm really curious to see, I think it's a cool vehicle. If, a, if Cadillac, if, if Cadillac can move them at, at 150 and change, Hey, Go for it. Yep. Go for hey, it. Smith, I yep. let's hit this next one kind of quickly because I I want to talk about Scout quite a bit because it kind of uh segues into our second segment. Yes. So real quick, let's hit the new Land Rover Range Rover Sport. Um it's it's in a very attractive vehicle. It's been it is clearly you can see that they put this thing in the wind tunnel and they took off every every bit of anything that could compromise the coefficient of drag because it kind of looks like it's a crossover that you know it just looks very very sculpted very very yeah just sculpted is the word i would put i mm -hmm. would put with it um yeah um, no, I, so. I, it, it it looks great um you can get you can get the bmw borrowed twin turbo 4.4 liter v8 in the first edition yep, yep. That 523 500. horsepower if you beat me to it and you can also get if you prefer a plug-in hybrid that makes only 434 only. horsepower but you get 619 pound feet of torque versus the the bmw borrowed engine has 553 pound feet of torque so you give up some horsepower you get a boatload of more, more torque mm -hmm. from that plug-in hybrid uh, power and train. and it's interesting the v8 is only offered in the first edition First edition is only offered for this year. So is this going to be the only time you're going to get that V8? Or will they offer, do, do you think they'll offer another Range Rover Sport with the V8 uh, further down the road, Bruce? 
I guess I don't know. You, my natural inclination is to say that it would be available later because by the time you tool up to be able to put a powertrain into a vehicle, you've made such an investment that you're going to keep doing it for more than one year. But if you look at what Jaguar, Jaguar and Land Rover have been doing, they have been very serious about their EVs and their plug-in hybrids and their hybrid tech in general. If you look at the other versions of the uh, Range Rover Sport, for example, they use mild hybrid tech other than the plug-in hybrid. So uh, part of me says yes, part of me says no, and I guess, I don't know, man. Like, it, it's an interesting question. I'm got. If I had to put money down in Vegas right now, I would say it's going to be more than one year. But if you ask me, I wouldn't say it was going to be more than three years. This is going to be a limited production thing because I think Jaguar Land Rover is very serious about their hybrid and EV tech. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since we were talking a little bit on Escalade V pricing um, with the Range Rover Sports, they already have their configurator out. So we went ahead and mm -hmm. did one of our most expensive posts. Okay. So the Escalade V starts at 149990 If you click every single option box on the Range Rover Sport, the most expensive model, which is the first edition right now with the V8, anyone out there in listener land, here's your chance to take a quick guess. We'll give you like five seconds to, to guess how much it's going to be. The... The the first edition starts at like what I think about a buck twenty. Yes, it's right. Th thereabouts. So, how expensive do you think the 2023 Land Rover Range Rover Sport is with every option box checked? You have five, four, three, two, one. It is one hundred and forty one thousand one hundred ninety dollars. That's a pretty pricey Range Rover Sport, isn't it, Bruce? But it's still nine grand less than the Escalade, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, nine grand. Yeah, basically. Yeah, but in 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 Range Rover uh, in Range Rover land, I mean that that's that's pretty pricey too. But hey, it's every option box is checked checked. It's the first edition. It's the only one with the V8. It's going to be something special. Um, sure. I did run through since since the the first edition is just going to be a limited model. I did run through the range topping hybrid. Um, that still tops out at 133 420. So it it's hey, the, these are luxury SUVs, folks. Yeah. And I've correct me if I'm wrong here because, you know, everyone has an opinion about mm -hmm. things. I've always preferred the Range Rover Sport over the regular Range Rover, you know, since it's been available simply because I feel as though it's the more usable version of the pair. Like it, Unless you have like a full family or very, very big dogs or something like that, the Range Rover Sport has always seemed like it does everything the regular Range Rover does, but at a slightly smaller size, maybe slightly less power, but not enough to really make it a compromise. It just it seems like the better version of those two vehicles. Am I out of line there? Well, I'll be honest, I've never given much attention to the Range Rover in general. Um, huh? They're neat, but they've just never really been in my radar. So I haven't really, uh, I haven't really, I haven't really stepped a toe into that arena enough. Okay. I think really to answer your question. I mean, I will say I, I love the way the, the Range Rovers look. Um, I mm -hmm. love their styling. Um, I love, I love the luxury inside. Um, I love the fact that the, the reliability um, means you can probably get one for a tenth of the starting price if you wait five or six years. Yeah, <clears throat> that's that's maybe maybe that's why I haven't paid much attention because it's like oh, the only one I could afford is going to be the one that's going to need like thirty grand in in repair work. Okay, doke. Well, okay. Let's talk. Stop talking about Land Rovers. Let's talk about. I always say, don't start the show with a showstopper. But we're getting towards the middle end ish of the show, so it's time for the showstopper. And that is the fact that Volkswagen has a new brand. Everybody, there's a new Volkswagen brand, and it's Scout. And if you're curious, yes, that's International Harvester Scout because they're bringing that band brand back. And they're bringing it back as an electric SUV and an electric pickup truck in 2026. And we're going to see a 
uh, like a semi-production version of what, 2024? Am I mistaken there? Supposedly, uh, here's here's where we stand. I, I mean, this, this news is just breaking a few hours ago as we're recording this. Um, oh, and before I, I jump into that, we are reading some comments later. If you're sticking around, oh, thinking, totally. yeah. thinking, hey, I, you know, where we get, we're going to get to no. some comments later. We have some great comments to catch up on, but yeah. we really want to talk about this because international scouts in the United States, off-roaders are very familiar with the classic international scouts. Um, the thing with this, it, it's being relaunched has a brand being called scout. Uh, Volkswagen is behind it, but Volkswagen has said this is going to be its own company. It's going to be based in the United States. Mm -hmm. They're going to do the designing, engineering, manufacturing, all in the United States. It's mm -hmm. going to be under the Volkswagen Group umbrella, but it's going to be its own separate entity, meaning that this, in theory, won't be a Volkswagen vehicle with a Scout badge put on it. This Correct. is going to be this is going to be its own effort done here in the United States. Um, the first production vehicle is supposed to be on the road in 2026. So if you do some really basic math, they've got about four years to make this happen. It's, it's ambitious, Bruce. Um, I think it's quite ambitious considering that the company hasn't technically been established yet. That's the, true. The, yeah. the news is just coming out today. Volkswagen says uh, the company will be established later this year. They'll schedule the, the current they plan. Are saying Yep. prototypes of the pickup and the suv will happen in 2024 yep that's some that's two years from now less than two years depending on when they mean like that's quick yeah it's a it's like i said ambitious considering the company hasn't been established yet one thing that volkswagen did say was uh the electric scout vehicles will use a new technical platform concept um that they don't offer any other details beyond that. No, it suggests to me that there's already something in mind as opposed to just, Hey, we're doing this. We're doing right. this completely from scratch. We're going to, we're going to have production vehicles on the road in four years. Um, I, I, forget. I mean, I've what been learning our... about cars long enough that traditionally what they always say is that it takes five years for a car to go from blank sheet of paper to production. Five mm -hmm. years is kind of the norm. So mm -hmm. if we're talking four years for these scouts, it suggests that maybe for a year they've been working on something that we haven't seen, just kind of getting things ready. And four years from now, we'll finally see it. Yeah, but, but there, there's one other small um, technicality here. Oh, yeah. That, what that, is it? That's five years development and prototyping to manufacturing and production mm -hmm. with a company that exists. <laughs> you're not wrong i mean the, the, I'm, I'm sure there's more going on behind the scenes yes. um where is it going to be built we don't know other than the united they states they said the u.s that's so yeah. I, I mean in that time okay you have to build a new manufacturing plant or but, are they no, are they going to are they going to use uh, they have that facilities? site in Chattanooga, though. They could build them there conceivably, right? Like, but, but I mean, as I interpret this, though, it's going to be its own separate company doing its own separate thing with its own separate leadership. I think that might be. A am, am I interpreting that a little too extreme, maybe? Maybe a little bit too much that it could be its own company. But we have seen what... Uh, Volkswagen and Audi vehicles come out of the same factories before. Like that's mm -hmm. not out of sure the realm of possibility. Like this could be, Hey, we maybe we're going to invest in a separate line in Chattanooga or something like that. And we are going to build it there. Like, I, I don't think that an entirely separate manufacturing center necessarily is what this is going to be. It's still going to be its own brand. Like that's what they're, at least from what they're saying, it's still going to be the scout brand, just like your Volkswagens, your Audis, your Porsches, your Bentleys, etc. Mm -hmm. Like it's still going to be its own brand, but maybe they're going to finagle things that it's going to come off of a production line at a factory that already exists. I don't mm -hmm. think that they're going to set up everything from scratch 
maybe I'm wrong, but that would be just a massive undertaking if that's it, what they mean that they're going to do. It, it certainly would. Um, but I think it's great that they're bringing the Scout brand back. Totally. Um, it's, it's focused purely at the United States. Um, mm-hmm. Whether or not that evolves later on to include other markets, that's I mean that remains to be seen. This is this is news literally just a, just a few hours old as we're reporting. So there's mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot coming in in the future on this. It came certainly has a bit of a shock, a bit of a surprise. But for classic off roaders, for fans of classic off roaders, you know what the Scout is built from the early '60s up to about 1980. Um, International Harvester was the company. Of course, International Harvester, they also produced a, a variety of farm equipment, tractors, have, yeah. um, engines, your international engines, their semi truck divisions. Um, yeah. International Harvester, as we know it, ended in 1985. The semi truck division continued on, has Navistar International. Um, and I didn't realize this just until today, Bruce, but Volkswagen through their, through their, their, one of their big truck divisions, I actually bought, uh, Navistar in, in 2020. So same here. I did not know that until today. That it feels like, yeah, it feels like maybe Volkswagen has been thinking about this for a little while. Yeah. I, yeah. It's just, it's funny that like I, as this news came out, I was like, wait, Volkswagen owns International Harvester. I put that in our Slack chat and I was like, that I didn't know that. that yeah. That's interesting. And apparently they do that that like you said, that they bought Navistar, which was the remnants of International Harvester, and Volkswagen owns Navistar and buy through that deal, they own the Scout brand and theoretically other uh vehicles that International Harvester made, like the Travel All and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Right. So I mean the Scout is going to be the brand here. We don't think there's going to be any mention of international um, no. in this. Uh, it's just everything be called that, Scout. Yep, from everything we we've seen thus far from Volkswagen says Scout. And hey, that's fine. Back in the day, you had several um, variations of Scouts, um, mm-hmm. small SUVs, small pickup trucks. Um, they were a Jeep competitor. Yep. And now going into the electric realm. Here's here's a question that I'll ask you, Bruce. And we'll pose this to everybody listening out there. What's going to reach market first? Uh, the new Scout electric truck or the Tesla Cybertruck? <laughs> Ouch. Sorry. I am not going to be a pessimist. Sorry. And I'm going. No, you're not wrong, but I'm not going to be a pessimist. I will give Elon Musk the benefit of the doubt as much as that pains me. And I will say the Cybertruck will happen first. Yeah. If it. I- does sit i won't like be too surprised because that's thing's been delayed and delayed and delayed but i'll give elon the benefit of the doubt and say and, cyber truck and there there have been certainly circumstances outside of tesla's control that have affected sure. not just tesla but everybody you know to, yes. just to be fair there but yes but gotta get a gotta get a little bit of a gotta get a little bit of a dig there i think the cyber truck is cool as hell totally um, do we want to hit some letters and then do our kind of interesting, uh, yeah, let's, not, let's do that because we're going to talk a little bit more about scout, but yes. we need to, we need to catch up on some comments, uh, from the last couple weeks. We, we didn't do any last week, uh, with our yep. special guest, Mike Schaefer, um, yep. which if you missed that podcast, go the hell back and watch it because yeah, that was a fantastic show. Um, Joe, Zaya, was... who's a frequent commenter, mm-hmm. he actually said it was his favorite show ever. Um, and he was his favorite guest ever. I, I personally, I Myron Vernus is our favorite is my favorite guest ever. But I can totally understand. Like Mike, you were fantastic, and you're welcome back anytime. And I mean, aside from being a, an insanely talented photographer, um, anybody who Good enjoys stories. cars, anybody who enjoys cars you take photos of cars, whether it's your own mm-hmm. car or you go to a car show. I mean, in addition to just sharing some of his properly crazy adventures um, in the automotive world. I, mean, I he love some... hearing about his Evo in Japan and that Dude. he was supposed to fly back every <laughs> six months and then COVID happened. He's like, well, I guess I got an Evo in Japan now. I got an Evo in Japan that I can't go and visit. Oh, the, the pain is real. Yeah. Great podcast to go back and watch. Um, yeah. J- Josiah mentioned, hey, my favorite guest so far up here with Clint and Gabe. 
Thanks, Josiah, for listening as always. Uh, we Ted Adam Green. Back, by the way, I was thinking about that recently. We we, we definitely do. We, we need, def- get, we need to get a lot of people back. Yeah, there, there's a lot, lot of people that uh, that we need to bring back on, and we're going to okay. do that here as as the year goes on. Uh, yep. Ted Adam Green says, "Wonderful ramble, even for someone like me that only had the audio podcast version." Keep up the great work, guys. Yeah, that's definitely one. If you have the chance, go check out the video version because we share some of his photos on there. Mm-hmm. Or you can go to MotorOne.com and view our our podcast posts. Um, and we have, we have links to, uh, to Schaefer's Instagram and all that good stuff. Um, going back a little bit further, a couple of weeks when we were talking about the Porsche 911 sport classic, the Mercedes AMG C 43, this is back at the end of April. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of the comments here. Uh, Ted Adam green, once again, great ramble. The 911 looks great with the wide body ventless rear fenders and ducktail spoiler. I totally agree. And I think, I think Porsche just like, I think they hoodwinked everybody on that because when the prototypes were running around, it's like, I mean, it looks a little bit wider and a little bit meaner, but without those vents, you're not thinking 911 turbo. Mm -hmm. So when they came out and said, yeah, the, the, the sport classic, it's really the turbo S we just had to create new fenders to, to give it that nice smooth look. And yeah, I think that just makes the car sing. Um, heart of jar also says that 911 SC is heart emoji, star emoji. Can't disagree with you there. That's, I think it's just a fantastic looking car all around. So thanks for those comments. Um, there's one other that I want to read, and this is something that Josiah sent us through email, and this is back at the end of April. And I really want to thank you, Josiah, for sending this in because it's a great little conversation piece that we're going to talk about for a little bit. Um, he says, Hey guys. I was wondering, since on the podcast you often do cheap car challenges scanning the car market, how can you detect a scam on eBay or Facebook Marketplace? Um, obviously, there, there's no real surefire way other than say buyer beware. Um, sure. If if you have if you have the 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 opportunity. Always, always, always go see a car in person. I know there are a lot of people that buy. Oh, I think you should. Oh, I don't know that there's a situation. Maybe I'm an old guy. I'm 36 years old, so maybe I'm the old guy here. I don't trust buying a car purely online. I want to be able to test drive it. I want to be able to see it. I want to be able to open the hood. Like, Mm -hmm. especially if it's something nearby me, like right. if it's on the other side of the country, maybe I would be willing to take a gamble. But if I'm looking at a car in Facebook marketplace or Craigslist or something like that, there's no way I'm buying it without at least a test drive first, especially a used car. Like mm-hmm. just do it. Um, well, and, and for, for cases where it's further away and, and I mean, this is just my personal advice. I've owned, I think I'm actually I'm holding steady at 34 cars. I haven't bought anything new since I got this Mustang. Um, it'll happen. It, it, it'll it'll happen sooner or later. But uh, I mean, for the longest time, I would just get a cheap used car, enjoy it for a year or so, um, have some fun, sell it, move on. So, yeah, I've had 34 cars over the last 20 years or so. Um, the things that, that I really look for, I look at photos. Um, it's for me. I mean, if I'm looking at say a car that's listed for sale here in Rapid City, South Dakota, and it's like, wow, that's a pretty good price, and they have some nice photos, and I see a palm tree in the background. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guess what? There are no palm trees in Rapid City, South Dakota. So I mean, little things like that can kind of tip me off that okay, maybe there's there's something a little sketchy here. Um, if if contact information isn't readily available. Or, and I know a lot of people use Gmail accounts, but I'm always a little hesitant if, if there's just a kind of a generic sounding Gmail email uh, associated with a post. So that's not to say that it's going to be a scam, but yeah, th- that, that, that always, that always makes me just, just a little more, a, a little more wary of, of where we're going. Um, if there are really sketchy photos, I know some people are just, I mean, they're, they're not. They're they're not professional sellers, right? Uh, They want to sell the car. uh, But if there are just kind of sketchy photos that show like a corner of the car or a part of the car, or if it's, God forbid, if it's taken at night, 
where you can't really see stuff. I mean, you can always contact the seller. Hey, can you give me some better pictures? Um, I'm always a little wary there. Um, I mean, otherwise, when it comes, especially when it comes to cheap cars for me, um, I'm shopping the seller as much as I'm shopping the car. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm contacting them. I'm emailing them um, after the after if there's some pretty good email communication, I like to try to talk to them on the, on the telephone, you know, ask them some questions straight up, um, you know, asking about condition, asking about mileage, all of that good stuff through that entire process. Generally, I feel like I, I can get to, you know, I can get to brass tacks, whether or not this is a car that I really want to pursue, or if it's a car that's, if not being just a straight out scam is something that's not necessarily being represented as it should be. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's kept me pretty safe over the years. Um, I also have just some general guidelines of a, if there's a fuel leak anywhere, just walk away because, yeah, bite you there. because hey, you know what? That's a pretty major thing that can sometimes be construed as pretty minor. Um, if you haven't fixed the fuel leak, why? You know, that, that's right. kind of my question. Why? And I say this because I didn't take my own advice several years ago. I found a 91 Subaru Legacy Turbo. And I had, you had that car for a little bit, though, didn't you? I, I only had it. I only had it for a few months. Um, oh, OK, I, I wrote about it in a previous life, actually, with uh, with Motor One editor in chief Seth Musma, um, working with him back then uh, as a flip this car series. and. I broke my own rule because I went to look at it. Nothing was mentioned about a fuel leak in the ad. Um, I drove a couple hours away. Here sits the car. It's dripping fuel. Oh yeah, it's just it's just a loose just a loose hose. I should have walked away right then. I had visions of being Colin McRae, you know, <laughs> and I was I I just absolutely love those first gen legacies. So I went ahead and I bought the car, and yeah, it, it wasn't a leaking fuel line. It was you know or leaking hose. It was the car was just rusted with an inch of its life and there was really mm -hmm. nothing I could do on it. So um steps like that. If obviously if if they're if the seller is cagey on just offering up some information, you know, if if you can't answer my questions, you know, it's like why? Mm -hmm. Right. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Totally. Um the the picture thing is kind of like I mean that's like the the first best the the first best way to, for me to kind of sniff out whether or not it's something I want to pursue. Like I said, mm -hmm. selling a car in Rapid City, palm trees in the background. Yeah, that car is not even close. Um, so, that, that's that, that's some of my advice, at least. Yep. Uh, Josiah, a few of my, and for any of our listeners, for my a few quick takes, anytime you see a car listed for $1 on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, just ignore it. It's never going to be good. The, the <laughs> fact that they put it on for $1 just says that they're trying to get clicks and trying to grab attention. Also, the si same thing, the one, two, three, four, same well, thing. Now, now I, I've never used Facebook Marketplace, but don't they have a, like a price limit on some of these? They do. But if you're, I, I oftentimes look for by year. So like sub 2000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. If I see $1 or one, two, three, four, I just ignore it. Mm hmm I, it's just, it's not realistic. It's, it's people trolling for clicks. Fair enough. Okay. The other thing I would say is that looking at the listing is the first step, not the last step that if you see a listing for a car that you're interested in, and you honestly think that you want to buy your Smith, you're absolutely right. The pictures, the look at them, like, if there are palm trees in the background and you live in an area where there are no palm trees, or if you, if you see snow in the background and you live in an area where it never snows, those are big red flags. So ignore those. But if you see a car that you think you're interested in and things start to look right, then that's the first step. Don't just immediately look at a car and message the guy and say, Hey, I'm ready to buy. You got to go look at it up close because people can hide everything in pictures people can hide you know maybe oh, yeah. there's a a, the, a back corner is crushed in and you, there just wasn't a picture of that or something like that it, what i'm saying is the listing is the first step that if you like the pictures then you can go on from there but don't just take 
what you see as gospel that because you know you, you can take pictures you can manipulate pictures in such a way that um you know you could kind of uh not necessarily know what you're getting so mm-hmm. and you know it always comes down to buyer beware totally uh, i mean there there are some very prominent people that have made online purchases and you know that have have found okay oh this isn't quite how it was represented not maybe maybe it's not so much a scam as just uh you know i should have done a little bit more research um but yeah my my two cents always look at the car in person if it's across the country and you're really interested find somebody out there to go look at it in person that's always that's always going to be the final you know sort of the the final step have totally. have some direct eyes on it somebody whether it's yours or somebody you trust i agree well, Smith, we've got about 15 minutes left of this podcast, yep. so it's time for our second segment, even though our <laughs> second segment is going to last 15 minutes. And so for anyone listening, we apologize. This is going to be a largely visual portion of the show, but um, at the very start, I talked about, hey, we kind of want to watch something with people. And so this is kind of putting our foot in the water with that. And so for anyone who's not familiar, there's a website called archive.org. And archive.org, as far as I can tell, is not indexed by Google. And they have just a treasure trove of everything. Whether you're looking for old magazines, old movies, old car brochures, which is what I'm about to show you. Old, Old brochures and ads maybe for an international scout? Exactly. Um, so. and, if, and if you can't, if you can't see this, if you can't go to Motor One Podcast and see this on YouTube, just close your eyes and imagine orange, brown, and sideburns. You have no idea how right you are, and and you're probably going to get a pretty good, a pretty good taste of it. Because yeah. I mean, so. the, the Scout was, uh, it was like I think 1960 or 1961, but you really saw them through the 60s and the 70s. And yep. yeah, that's, that's, that's so what we're here is now. the 1976 brochure for the international scout. And I'm sharing that right now. And I just and think so, it's, I think it's fantastic. Scout. And, and to be, and to be fair, this isn't just an international scout thing. If you look at brochures from the seventies, I mean, they, they're all going to kind of look like this and it's just, sure. It, it, it was, it was just some of the beauty of that era. Right. Yep, it totally was. And we're going to try to describe this. I am going to try to describe this in audio as best as I can. So we have 1976 International Scout Terra. Terra was their pickup truck model at mm-hmm. the time. And their uh, their catch their catch line is, Scout the America, others pass by. And so, unfortunately, you have this Scout pickup truck in... I don't. Is that yellow? Is that's it beige? that's gonna be that's gonna be like a, I think that's gonna be like a seventies, like really really pale kind of cream yellow. Okay, yeah, and then brown, and it looks like it's in the wasteland. You can see some rocky mountains in the back with some snow capped mountains, but it looks like it's in a swamp because this tree next to it is dead, deader than dead. And well, that's that's those... the area that you would pass by. Exactly. And it's got a bunch of horses next to it because this is an off-road vehicle. So that is the cover that they give you. And so Loving the an- white wall tires on that, too. How often do you see a truck with white wall tires? Never. And so this is an eight-page brochure. And so Smith and I are going to kind of, we are going to be the Rift Tracks or Mystery Science the Year 3000 of car brochures right now for these eight oh pages. Oh, boy. I better so- take another drink for this one. Exactly. So page one, internet 1976 international scout Terra, the only midsize pickup on the market, a real pack house for work and pleasure. And it shows one in red again with the Brown, almost kind of faux wood ish siding on it. it. Is that, is that Brown or is that like a, like a beige or, I think or, it's or an wood. orange? It could be, Oh, burnt orange maybe uh, maybe a burnt orange with brown i mean it's i mean it is 70s to the core yeah 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 with the, uh, with the white wall tires still still i th- i think it's got the white walls in every picture. yeah i, I think all of these i don't have, know have yet the, but have so the thin can, white walls 
We can oh, see oh, some ooh. folks camping. I Th- that image that... has a guitar. Can you can you zoom in on the guitar? I've got to I've got to take a look. I at only the see the guy lighting a cigarette. Where's the guy? With... Oh, there's the guitar. Okay. Yeah, yeah the yeah, guitar. Yeah. Who places their guitar that close to the campfire? You're just asking to light that thing on fire. Okay, back back well, to your, the guy back in to your the vehicle out here. Lighting, you can see clearly lighting a cigarette in this tent. Like I'm done with you, Phil. I'm gonna eat a cigarette. That damn is it. that is straight out of Austin Powers. Um, um, oh, what was what was the second one? Not Spy Why can't Who Shagged I... Me. Oh yeah, no, yeah. Spy no, Who International me. Man of Mystery is the first one. Spy Who Shagged Me. Yep, Spy one. Who Shagged. That's that's right out of Austin Powers. The uh, the infamous. I'll I'll just say the infamous scene and leave it at that. Where where the guy shadowed like perfectly in the tent. You can see his cowboy hat. You can see Only him this smoking. guy. You can, you can clearly see, him see up you can see his cigarette. You can see him lighting it. He is he's just there. He is not. He has no privacy. This poor man. But boy, that that scout is just lit beautifully, isn't it? Yep, it totally is. Okay. Next page. Here we go. So selective four wheel drive gets it done when the going gets tough. And so you can see here again, it's kind of a yellowish cream with a white stripe on this one. Yeah. Uh, dashboard mounted four wheel control makes switching over easy. And this one is kind of in town. You can see it's got guys got a riding lawnmower in back with just a ton of stuff. Sorry, my eyes water in here. That's why I'm watching it. Should, if you're watching on YouTube. Um, and that is, got- that is, that is like a classic, like, P green on that truck, it looks like. Oh, that's totally P green. Yeah, that, that's, that's that like totally that's totally seventies like green. That? No, I you know I bet that's gonna be some like like a like a big canvas bag or something. For, uh, okay, uh, for, for the yard mower that you throw stuff in. Yeah, because because it's towing a, a trailer with a gloriously nineteen seventies lawn tractor, white yep. with a with a bright orange body. Um, can we can we go back up though for a second? Sure we um, can. To, to, to look at that other yellow, to look at that yellow. This guy? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that yellow scout. Now that, his, uh, that looks bike? like, that looks like it has some, some pretty snazzy wheels on it, doesn't it? it I mean, does. that's, that's not, that's not the regular, just kind of solid chrome hubcap. Right. Those aren't steel. That, that's got some wheels, yeah. um, but it still has the white walls. I love it. <laughs> and the big white stripe. The and big white stripe on the this side. yellow uh, dirt bikes. The, yep. Little, yeah. little, uh, little bed rails, little chrome bed rails on the side. That's oh, a sporty yeah, yeah, looking, yeah. that's a sporty looking little truck. Totally. Uh, let me read this here, text here. Scout the Americas. Others pass by with selective four wheel drive on your Terra. Four wheel drive lets your Terra pack a ton of camping equipment into hunting, fishing country. Uh, drive to a remote beach while surfing uh, with surfing gear, or pull a boat down to the river in the canyon. Scout Terra with four wheel drive gives you the best of two worlds: work and play. I mean, it's I, it, hey, it's it's standard brochure speak oh totally it's just it's fun you know like i love these guys here in the single cab first off oh oh, okay there we go volkswagen if you're listening you gotta offer these stripes you have to like this brown truck with white stripes and it's not like narrow i mean it's it's like a large wise if you're familiar with like the 80s uh ford f-series where you would get the two-tone trucks um, that had you know the the separate color like right in the middle of the side, uh, the, you know the two tone right. This stripe is like that. Um, it's a dark brown truck with the white stripe that starts on the hood. Yeah, you um, can see it clearly go, on the hood. goes down to the side, and it it encompasses most of the side. That would be a that would be a great little retro touch. And then you've got these guys just kind of chilling in the bed. Yeah, I am. While, while the truck is one of them doesn't have a cigarette in his mouth. I am shocked and amazed. Hey, you never know. We uh, we kind of can't really see it that well. Okay, to be honest. Yeah. yeah, the Terra has a six foot bed and a two thousand pound weight capacity to let you carry a lot of cargo, is what the uh, brochure says. And and you know, I mean, this is a fairly small truck, but most modern full size trucks these days have a six and a half foot bed or even slightly smaller bed. In mm-hmm. favor of having a larger cab, so right. This is a single I mean, cab I mean, truck. I mean, yeah, I mean, a little single cab truck with a six foot bed. Nobody's really making that these days. But then no. again, this was at a time when trucks weren't the main vehicle of choice for families or or for people. They were they were work. 
right? They mm-hmm. were they were workhorses. Well, I mean, look so, at these images. You've got guys with some hay bales. You've got a guy who it appears to maybe has a lawn care business or something like that. And then you've got the guy with the dirt bikes with the taking dirt them bikes. off yep. road. Like you can see these were work vehicles. Different different times. Different yep. times. And then uh, we're on page three now. Page three of seven. Scout Terra. Ruggedness and comfort. Takes it tough and easy. And so you get all of the specs of the truck, which we wouldn't actually... I don't see brochures that do this today, but you've got literally... You've got wheelbase, overall length, width, width tailgate yeah. opening, front tread, rear tread, ground clearance, just like everything you could want to know. Um, well, all the brake you know, angle, stuff like and, that. And back, in, back in my day before the internet, this is how people had to learn about their vehicles. <laughs> Thanks, Smith. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, you got this, this great this drawing brings back, here. This brings back flashbacks because it, in a previous life when I was doing some freelance work, um, I actually did a lot of work for, I can't remember the name of the website, but it, it was it was a, an F-series history website. Oh, and, you sent me that one time. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I, I mean, I just pulled so much. I was able to find just about all of these old F-series brochures. And I mean, it was, it was just, it was a time suck because I just enjoyed reading them. Mm-hmm. You know, totally. getting, getting all of this old information. And it was like, it's like, I didn't realize that, you know, like the three on the tree, you know, the, the column shift manual transmission, there were a lot of trucks that still had that well into the eighties. Oh, totally. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's get anyway. into the accessories catalog real quick. Cause they have that here too. So you've got, and Smith, these are the ones that you, you reference. It still has the white wall tires yep. or the white strip tires, but chrome plated wheels with radial tires, chrome slotted rims with chrome lug nuts, chrome rear axle end plates and steel belted radial tires. Uh, you've got a winch. You've got, what is that? Floor console uh, with, for bucket seats that you can use to hook, uh, to keep food in you mm-hmm. got the pickup rails that you mentioned uh just before you got a snow plow that's yeah the, yeah uh power steering just you know all sorts of stuff and then uh oh look comfort. at these look at these interior shots we're on to yeah. interior shots now well folks. here i'm gonna and... go down to the interior trim and i'm gonna zoom in here you can get saddle vinyl tanned bark which is like brown and beige mm-hmm. i guess uh, parchment, Wedgwood blue, which is obviously, and then ivy green. And then on the exterior, you can get white, solar yellow, glacier blue, terracotta, which is kind of a burgundy, mm-hmm. Grenoble green. That's dark, the key green. Yep. Dark. I guess that's meteor brown. I, I'm going to guess that's metallic. Would mean. I'm going to guess that's, um, a, that, that's a dark metallic brown. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. Uh, fire orange. Fire orange. orange buckskin and pewter metallic now let's let's talk about buckskin for a moment because i I mean i hate to be crude but that's that's like diarrhea brown it kind of is i that's that's diarrhea brown and on the interior colors we mentioned wedgwood blue ivy green parchment but understand folks this is the 1970s none of those are solid colors those are all like a print where no. it, it, it's got it's Other got a pattern. Saddle is the only solid color. All the rest of them are. Yeah, prints. it's it, it's a print where it's it's varying light to dark in stripes, and it's I mean it's gloriously seventies. If you're into that. Oh, sort totally. Of thing. Yeah, we're talking about 1976 here. This mm-hmm. is the height of the seventies. It doesn't get more seventies than this. And also that Grenoble gra- green, that pea green, for the exterior. I think I'd have to go with that. No, nope. if I was buying one. Nope. No. What are no. you picking? Um, you know, I might go with the solar yellow. I'm not usually a yellow person, oh, but that okay. pale, but the pale yellow. Well, or yeah, we kind of saw it up here, didn't the, we? The here, pale yellow with the white. Um, that's, or you know, what, that's... you know what? That dark brown metallic. I hate brown on a vehicle, but to to just get the proper feel of this era, if I go with that dark metallic brown with a what color what color stripe was on that was on that vehicle like dark metallic brown with oh with the white stripe that's the kind of white stripe but i i would want like a like an orange stripe if you go like dark metallic brown with a with an orange stripe that i mean brown and orange and yellow those are like the colors of the 70s and then in my my mind 
Oh, totally. And then here at the very end, you can see all of the specs that they offered it in four by two and four by four configurations. And then they've got some fantastic photos with it hauling a ho tiny horse trailer in a pickup version with the, the I assume the Rockies. Uh, those look like the Rockies to me in the background. Uh, it's photoshopped. <laughs> yeah. In 1976, <laughs> it was photoshopped. It's photoshopped. Then, I love this shot, which appears to be at like a uh, like a frat house or something like that. It, I like it looks, it looks like a frat house, right? Who's just like, Hey baby. And she does not look comfortable. And then you've got all of the guys on the left-hand side in the bed who are loading it up to go. Look at uh, that plaid sofa or, or, or plaid easy chair in the yeah. bed of that truck. Why is there a baby bassinet carrier thing? What, mm. what is that going on? Uh, yeah. I, 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 it does not fit with the rest of this photo, but they got themselves a big, uh, like a milk jug and like something that looks like that you would use to put moonshine in, uh, with, these guys were the having a good carriage night. and that's, yeah. and that's what that's going to be the, uh, that's the yellow truck with the, with the Brown stripe yes. on the side. Totally. Um, with the, just the, what I call the moon hubcaps and the white wall tires. Everything oh, totally. has white walls here. Everything's got white walls. And then here's the last bit. Uh, here are the 1976 International Family of Scouts. You got the Scout 2, and this one is in red with a white stripe that goes over the hood. Mm -hmm. You got the and Scout that, and that's, Traveler. That's an SUV, to, to, just yeah. to be clear. That's, that's, a, yeah. that's an SUV two-door. And then the Scout you Traveler. You got Scout Traveler, which has a white top and white uh, stripes along the side. And I'm fairly certain on the Traveler that roof was removable. Mm -hmm. Don't quote me on that, but I'm 90% sure of that. And then you got the Scout Terra, which is the one that we were looking at, which is the that's pickup the truck. truck. Mm -hmm. And that is like the, I guess that's pea green. That's either the pea green or that yellow color you like with brown stripes along the side. Yeah, it's, it's a photograph from the 70s. All yeah. the colors kind of. All the colors kind of blend a little bit over time, but Volkswagen, if you're listening, here's here's a little taste of of what you could do if you wanted to go a little retro. Volkswagen, um, you got to offer these stripes. I'm scrolling up now. Let you have to offer brown with white stripes, and like that looks so good. It. I hate to say, it, it kind of does, or. No, actually, it, it doesn't. It doesn't look good, but I still love it for sure. the for the context that it's in. If I mean, it's it's one of the it's it's one of the color schemes I would go for. If those were orange stripes with the brown, woo. Okay, it's it, it's not pretty, but it's seventies, and I'd have it. And, and Smith, so super quick here, yep, we're going to do a three minute version of this because we're at an hour and seventeen minutes. I found this also on archive.org. Uh -oh. They have the British uh, brochure for the Nissan 300ZX, the Z31, oh, that you can get the turbo. I hate I you love, right now. I love the fact that it still has the dealer, Dan Perkins UK Limited uh, in Watford. Yep, I hope you're still in there. business. Um, but we're going to look, do the super look quick. at that. It is for the 300ZX and the Turbo ZX. They call them super they cars, them super which cars. is. It might be a bit of a stretch. I like well, these I mean, cars. I mean, those were still, I mean, th those were still what? 200 horsepower, I think in, in that yeah. trim. Yeah. Um, and this is in, the turbo. In the early mid eighties. It's bad. got the lower fascia with the turbo on it. It's got the scoop right over scoop. the turbo. It's got the T tops. It's got the T tops. You are killing me, Bruce. Yeah. It's I've got, got to move it a few seats. months. I can't be looking at more z31s i can't and here's the t-tops off and they're just showing you all the bells and whistles like you've got the cool stereo for the oh, time. that 80s you've got that the, 80s dash with yeah, more buttons the, than a fighter jet that was exactly. you got the pop was up era, headlights man. and like i said the t-tops uh here's page 10 so we'll do two more pages here they just like basically showed it off in every way they could here it's loading here so you can see it on the track going through the slalom going through the snow in the wind tunnel in production, just a body in white. And then they, you know, they show the different versions. And then last page here is back to the car here in the rear. So I wanted to share that with you real quick. What a, what a great looking car. And I'm, I'm happy and sad to see values going up on those mm -hmm. 
it means that people are starting to appreciate and remember just how cool those cars were. Um, it also means it's just going to be harder for me to get one later on, but yeah, it will happen eventually. What a totally. show, man. Yeah, man, this was fun. What, um, what a show. What a walk down memory lane. I'm super stoked to hear that scouts coming back. Um, same. I it's, think it's, I had no idea Volkswagen owned that name and hearing that they're like, yeah, we are going to make a U.S. focused brand called Scout. That's a cool idea. Like, I, it's, you know, well, none of us know about the vehicle yet, but it's a cool idea. It's smart. And how long have we been saying? And and when I say we, I, I mean, like the, the automotive community in general, why isn't Volkswagen trying to step a foot into the pickup truck market in the United States yeah. when when they have something available? Well, maybe, maybe this is the reason. Um, And by launching it with a name that's familiar in the United States. Or I'm excited to see where it goes. Familiar because like it takes guys, you're like guys in their thirties and their forties to know what that is, but at least it has a legacy. It has something they can build on. They can show, you know, brochures like we just showed with like, you know, people taking them off road and hauling dirt bikes and hauling stuff with like, it's a name with a history and with a legacy that they can build on for the new version. I can feel um, my sideburns growing right <laughs> exactly. now. Yeah. Af- after looking at those brochures, it's just, it's just coming out. I've got some ABBA I'm going to go listen to here in a bit. That sounds good, man. Awesome. All right, man. Um, so real quick. Uh, so as I said earlier, I got our weeks confused. We should, um, assuming he's in good health, which he wasn't in last time because of a story I want him to tell because it's fantastic, (laughs) but we should have Larry Casilla from ammo NYC with us next week as a guest. And then we also have a guest uh, scheduled for the week following that. So, um, and and I should jump in and say, if you have any thoughts on the international scout thoughts on anything that we've talked about, email us podcast at motor one.com go to motor one podcast on YouTube, comment there, go to motor one.com on Fridays. When the article goes up, you can comment there. And if you have any questions about detailing for our guests next week, yeah, go ahead and send those our way too, because uh, this particular person has some serious experience. Oh, totally. And we're talking we're, we're talking about some experience with some very, very cool cars. So yep. it's going to be a great episode. Email us, comment. You know, we read them. You know, we we listen. We try to comment and respond when we can. Yeah. Next week's going to be cool. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, everyone, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening or good night. We appreciate all of our listeners. We appreciate all of our comments. Um, I got a little bit backed up. It's been a little bit busy this week. So mm-hmm. there are some comments on our YouTube page that I haven't responded to yet. But if you're listening, I will get back to you. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, we appreciate it. And so bye bye, everybody. We'll see you next week.